goes back to a government policy to continue to find new ways to enable credit creation, right? And so mm, yeah. they keep moving from asset to asset and finding ways to securitize new groups of assets in order to continue to drive asset prices higher to enable more credit to be borrowed against those assets, right? It's the ultimate Minsky yeah. and Ponzi scheme, right? And maybe and you can solve a riddle yeah. for me. Yeah. yeah, Maybe you can solve a riddle for me because I've been struggling with how to square this circle in conversations. I'm looking at these home prices rising and household borrowing rising exponentially and thinking this is crazy, thinking mm. it's irresponsible to be buying homes at these prices. But the, the counter argument, which I'm struggling to overcome, is that if you look at the total cash flow cost of mm. home ownership right now, because mortgage rates are so low, that mm. it, in fact, if you go back to the 1970s, even though obviously interest rates were very high, home prices yeah. were so low. And so, you know, the, the actual size of the mortgage relative to incomes was really, was really small. Yeah. Now the size of the mortgages relative to incomes is gargantuan, but it doesn't matter because interest rates are near zero. And so the carrying cost of, of home ownership is so low, but I think this is unsustainable and I still feel like it's irresponsible to go out and buy a home at 10, 10 or 15 times your income. Hmm. But, Help me square this circle. Well, the, partly because the deposit is what's been rising in scale. Uh, yeah, yes, the, once you have the deposit to buy a house, then the cash flow costs are very low. But that deposit is enormous. And uh, in, in what is often happening, people in, in, in Australia to talk about you know, going and borrowing from the house, the, the bank of mum and dad. Um, so the previous generation pays for the next generation where they are homeowners. But if you don't have that, if you're somebody from a poorer background, you can't even get on there, on that black ladder. And I was actually thinking about my own parents uh, just recently on this front. Uh, they bought their first house when they were, uh, actually they, they got a gift. They did have the house of bank of mum and dad that, uh, that, that got, them, got them going. But the, the house price was so low that a 30% deposit was the rule. Now what's happened over time is banks have said, oh, well, we'll help you out. We'll make it a 20% deposit and then a 10% deposit, and then a 5% deposit. And hey, we'll give you 120%, we can pay for the furniture as well. And what, what is happening is we're letting the finance sector take over the ownership of the economy. And, and that's really been the overall impact. So, uh, and, and then if you look at the age at which people are buying property, my parents, when they were, my father was 22, uh, when uh, he got married, and it was a common thing for somebody in their 20s to be have a, have a mortgage and a home they own. And then as time's gone, it's now 40-year-olds that do it. So the more we drive up the prices, the smaller a cohort is actually able to buy into the housing. You get, it becomes a, a form of class division again, which is bad enough to begin with. It makes it worse. Um, and, and then also, um, it, it's so late for people. They're coming in with so much debt now. With how, they haven't got housing debt in America, of course, and Australia too, in the UK, you've got student loan debt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you simply can't even imagine getting that deposit together without effectively becoming a slave of the financial sector. Now, that is what has become the outcome of that. We are all slaves to Wall Street. And uh, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be capitalism, not a slave system. But when you're, a, when you're, a, when you're a, a peon of debt, then you might as well be owned by Wall Street. And that's what yeah. we've let happen. Yeah.